Hello, this is Gary Young from Royalty Exchange, and we're going to start in just a minute. All right, guys. So this is Gary Young from Royalty Exchange. Um, JT, Matt, it's good to have you. Um, so, so basically, this is a once a month thing that we do where we collect questions from anybody in the artist, songwriter, producer, rights holder side of our marketplace. And I go through and answer those questions. And so I start with the ones that were sent in in advance, but uh, if you have any questions as I'm going along, you can use the Q and A button down at the bottom of your screen to type in those questions and I'll answer them. And also, if you want, you can raise your hand if you just wanna ask your question verbally rather than typing it out and I could turn on your audio. Um, so, I'm going to get started. So first, quick, quick bit on Royalty Exchange. So Royalty Exchange is a marketplace where we connect folks that own royalty streams with investors who want to invest in those royalty streams. And, you know, we've worked with a lot of songwriters, artists, producers, other rights holders, right, and help them raise money to do lots of different things, whether that's a songwriter who wants to become a performing artist and wants to invest in their career, whether it's helping folks buy their first house, invest in other businesses, put some money away for a rainy day. That's what we do, right? Um, so, and we connect you with those investors to do that. So, okay, let's get started with the questions that were sent in advance. So first question is, are instrumental music catalogs marketable? If so, what size catalogs are an average sale? 10 pieces, 50 pieces, et cetera. So it's a good question. Instrumental music catalogs uh, can be marketable. It really depends on how the music is used. So. If it's music that is basically licensed to a production music library where music supervisors for TV shows go in and pick and choose different mood music, things like that for the background of TV shows, it's not really marketable. We don't work with that mostly on the site. We found investors don't pay that much for that sort of music, so we don't work with it. 
Now, if it's instrumental music that people are listening to and streaming on Spotify or the different services, Apple Music, Amazon, whatever, then there could be something there. The, uh, the second part of the question is interesting. Um, the number of pieces in a catalog doesn't really matter. All right, so we've done deals where it's a catalog that has 100 songs in it, and we've done deals where it's a single single song in the catalog. So it's less about how much music is in there, and it's more about the consumption of that music that really matters, okay? So that's the first question. Next question, um, can an artist sell half of a catalog? Yes. Um, we do partial deals all the time. And the key is, you know, we work backwards from what your goals are. So if it's to raise a certain amount of money to accomplish a goal, then we look at your catalog and figure out how we can hit that goal. And often that means only doing a deal for a portion of the catalog. So say 50% of the royalties from these songs. And sometimes it means putting together something where it's only a few of the songs in your catalog that we can help you accomplish your goal with. All right. So there's a lot of flexibility here. So it can be something like 50% of a single song, 50% of your whole catalog, three of the hundred songs you have. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility based on what your goals are. All right. And we'd like doing those partial deals because it's not the end of the story for your music, right? You're still gonna get paid royalties on those tracks, just not as much as you were before, but you're gonna get a lot of money today, right? That you can use to invest in your career. Um, next question is, do, do we work with UK catalogs all the time? Uh, we can work with publishers out of the UK, record labels out of the UK, PRS, which is the Performing Rights Organization in the United Kingdom. We do those deals all the time. So there's no, no issues there. Um, okay. How do potential buyers hear our song list? Are they able to listen briefly to the songs? Yeah, so when we put a catalog on our site for auction, there's a tab that has media in it. And that's where investors can listen to the songs that are in your catalog. So that's how they, they can see it and hear those things. Next question is, how is catalog value determined? Oh man, I could talk for hours on this. So I'll try to keep it somewhat brief though. Um, so, so basically catalog value, it, we're looking at how much the royalties, how much in royalties have the songs generated? And then we're looking at how old those songs are. So generally a good rule of thumb is the older the songs in your catalog are that are making money, the more valuable your catalog is. And that's because investors will pay a premium for consistency. And generally song comes out, you know, it's a, it's a hit. There's a lot of money that's generated in the first two years and then the royalties decline to some sort of base level. And when you're in that base level, investors will pay a lot for it. When you're in that sort of initial spike, they pay less on a relative basis because they're not sure how far it's going to drop, right? And so that, that's the age part. The other part is how is the catalog making money? And I think this is probably easier to demonstrate with a few examples than just speaking hypothetically. So a song that's a hit on the radio today, right? It's, it's still in that sort of initial spike. If most of the royalties are coming from terrestrial radio, the value of the catalog is going to be less because those formats constantly are shifting, right? And so your song is on the radio, it's making a lot of money today. As the format changes and your song leaves radio, those royalties are going to decline a lot, right? And so, whereas a song that's been out for a while and is mostly earning from streaming is going to be more valuable, as is a song that is 
earning from streaming at a younger age, right? And so, and then the other piece that is important is catalogs, especially on the publishing side, right? If you're making a lot of money from syncs, so when, when someone wants to use your song for an advertisement, for a TV show, or for a movie, generally investors value those less because they can go away in their one-time payments. So basically you look at it and the way catalog values are determined, how old is it? What are the sources of income? And are those sources of income going to continue? Okay. Um, all right, so now the next question. Um, I am, I have many demos and I want to be able to sell my songs. How possible is this? So what we do is we work with songwriters who have songs that are already released and are earning royalties. Um, we don't, we don't work with things that haven't been released and haven't been earning. And the reason is because that's just not our core expertise. Right, our core expertise is connecting you with thousands of investors who want to buy the royalties for songs that are already out. When it comes to if you have demos and you're trying to get an artist to record your song or you're trying to, you know, uh, get your big break, that's going to be the purview of music publishers or record labels or a manager. And they can help you take, you know, the, the art that you've made and get lots and lots of people to hear it. It's not what we do. Um, okay. So then, uh, we are a record label. Oh, this is a good one. We are a record label based in Kathmandu, Nepal. Can we sell our music? We have full copyrights for the album. We've never done a deal with a Nepalese record label, but we would love to. Spent a lot of time in Kathmandu. It's a beautiful place. Um, there's no real restrictions on who we can work with internationally. It's just a function of how the royalties are being uh, collected and paid out. Okay. So next question is, what factors do you look at when buying a catalog? Okay. So I think this is important because, so first we don't buy any catalogs ourselves, right? We're the marketplace. We connect you with investors who buy them, right? And investors are looking at a lot of the things that we talked about in how do you value music, right? The other piece that I didn't bring up in the answer to that question is they're also looking at how prominent the song is and how big the artist is associated with it. And generally we've seen when you have a superstar artist who's recorded your song and made it very popular, that's gonna fetch a higher price than a more niche artist that, that perhaps the world hasn't heard of. They, they might have a really rabid fan base, but they may not be in that sort of general popular consciousness that a superstar might be. Okay. Next question, what is the best way to get a catalog valuation? So the best way to get a catalog valuation is there's a form on our site. You can fill it out and tell us a little bit about your, your music. And then what we do is we'll, we'll have a conversation with you, talk about your goals. We'll collect the statements that show you know, how your catalog is making money. Our team of analysts will look at it, will come back to you and say, okay, this is, here's what's good about your catalog. Here's some of the issues with your catalog. This is what we think investors will pay for it and talk through that whole process. So the best thing to do to get a catalog valuation is to go to click the top raise money, which is one of the top menu items on our site and go through the process that's on that page. And then we'll be able to give you a sense of how much you could raise from your back catalog. 
those evaluations are all free as well. So there's no obligation. Um, and we, you know, we provide that service free of charge. Now the idea is we want you to work with us to raise money, but you don't have to. Okay. Um, all right. So what sort of contract is signed with the composer or artist? And what are the key details? So if you're going to work with us, the first step is, you know, you sign a listing agreement and the listing agreement basically has four key components to it. So the first is what's for, what's for sale on our site. All right. So this is going to detail the songs that are included, what sources of royalties are included, that sort of thing. Second thing is our fee. So, we charge 15% of the final price we get you at auction. So, and the reason we do that is because we want our incentives and your incentives to align, right? So we want to make more money, the more money we make you, right? Rather than having some standard flat fee, if we can put together a deal that makes sense to you and you're happy with, we want to get paid on that. But if we can't, then we don't want to get paid at all. It keeps us honest. Right? Um, so that's the second thing. And then, you know, the third thing is basically the starting price of the auction. Right? And the, and this is a key component because the starting price is the reserve price in our marketplace. So what the auction is going to start at is going to be the minimum that you'll be obligated to accept. And, you know, we can, we go back and forth on starting prices all the time, but that's, that's the other key component to that listing agreement. And it's important to, to talk about for a second. So that listing agreement is two pages long. It's written in plain English because we, and it's standardized. So we use the same agreement for all of the deals that we do. So unlike a lot of business that's done in music, it's not a 60 page agreement. You don't need an army of lawyers going back and forth to figure out what's included. It's standard. We've done 920, 24 transactions using that agreement before. So we don't really change it. Um, but it, it lowers the, the cost of doing business with us because anybody can read that agreement and understand the whole thing in like 15 minutes or less. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, why would a publishing company sell just two or three songs? Um, that's a good question. So, what we've seen is that most catalogs are pretty concentrated. So, you know, you, you've written 50 songs in your career. Of those 50 songs, 10 of them make any amount of money. And of those 10 songs, probably two or three are actually your big earners. And so most of the deals we do are partial deals. So we're looking at the songs that are making money today and putting together something, a package of those songs that makes sense to help you accomplish your goals and working backwards from that. And so the traditional way that this has been done in the music business is it's an all or nothing deal. It's your whole catalog. Songs that are making money, songs that have been released but aren't making money, songs that haven't been released. And we don't think that makes sense because we want you to keep the upside from the songs that haven't been released um, versus, you know, selling all of it to someone and they get the upside if the songs turn out to be hit someday for someone. So, so that's why they would do it. Just do a handful of songs and it's to, to accomplish their goal and, uh, and also to keep the future upside from, from those. Um, okay, so let's see. Next question is, uh, okay, how much is my whole song catalog worth and how soon can I sell it? 
Interesting. Okay. So um, the way we can figure that out is if we get access to your royalty statements, we could look at it, figure out exactly um, how much the catalog is, is worth. We can tell you that and, um, and then, you know, we could get started and it'll take us probably 30 days to put together the transaction and make the deal happen. Um, okay. Let's see. So, so that's basically the end of the pre prepare like pre sent in questions. Um, does anyone who's on the call right now have questions for me that I'm happy to answer and see, see if there's any questions that you guys have that have perhaps been inspired by the other questions. You can use the Q and A function that's down at the bottom of your screen to type in those questions. Oh, Matt. Okay. I like it. Here we go, Matt. I'm going to allow you to talk. Hey. Hey, Matt. How are you? I'm good. You, Gary? Oh, I can't complain. Things are good. Greetings from the jungles of Los Angeles. Nice. I'm in the sunny, sunny high plains of Denver. Hallelujah. I work there a lot. Um, you, you guys are so ahead of my intelligence on this whole thing. Oh, um, man. No, I'm serious. I have been scoring for a circus for 20 years out of okay. all, all original. I'm the one that said the, uh, uh, the, the instrumental tracks, Gary. Okay. What, what I don't understand, and in, in, in your end of the business, you've invented something really creative. Why would somebody invest in somebody's uh, catalog? Yeah, that's a great question. I, why would Mr. X say, I want to buy, invest in somebody's catalog? Just clarify that to me if you could. Totally, totally. Um, okay, so I think, I think there's, a couple, there's a couple reasons, key reasons. So um, the first is the, the investors in our marketplace, right? And I'm going to try to not go super esoteric finance here, but, but we're probably going to go down that road a little bit. Please. So, so basically you have, there's things in, in investing that are called uncorrelated assets, okay? And that's just a fancy way of saying things that don't go up and down based on what the stock market does that day, right? And music is one of those things. And so, because music, especially in 2020, music royalties are generated by consumption. And if the stock market is down, 10% today, right? That doesn't mean people suddenly stop listening to music. So the royalties continue, right? And so you have this enormous pool of investors that are looking to basically diversify the money that they have invested for, for retirement, for income, for all those sorts of things. And they're trying to find creative ways to invest that money that is going to offset some of the risk that comes with you know, owning stocks, bonds, and real estate. And so, um, so that's, that's the first reason. And then the second reason is because, you know, music royalties, they generate income. And there's very few places that you can buy something that generates cash today, right? Most of it's really expensive and, and you don't get much, much income out of it. And so, so basically it's the pairing of, and so if, if you think about it, you have, folks that have lots of lots of money that they're looking for a good home for it and then you have folks that have created amazing art that need or want large sums of money that they can make investments in themselves and our business exists to connect the two and that's that's really it i mean does that does that answer your question or was that not yeah uh, um am i on yes yeah, yeah, it does, Gary, answer the question. Thank you. So it would be unlike my catalog, which is used for a show, which mm -hmm. is, uh, again, a 20 year show, a, a 300 piece catalog, da 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 da. da. Your uh, business operates better if 
the tracks are established in a, in the public mar uh, marketplace. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's what you're selling. Okay. That's clear to me. Okay. Cool. That's way clear. Thank you so okay, much. Okay. Good. I'm glad. No, no, no. You clarified it perfectly. Okay. Awesome. Oh, and, and last thing I should say too is, and I'm, I'm talking against our business, but like, if you're thinking about it, whether it's you or anybody listening, right? If you don't have a reason to sell a piece of your royalties, you shouldn't do it, right? Because the investors are not buying this stuff to lose money on it, right? And so like the, if you think about the way that it's, a, it's like a time value of money question, right? So like mm -hmm. no investor, and sometimes they, sometimes they probably spend too much and the deal doesn't work out, right? They don't make, they don't make what they thought they were going to make, yeah. but no one is going into these transactions buying music royalties to lose money. Right? Yes. So if there's not, if there's not a reason, like if, if having a large amount of money today, you couldn't put it to use, then you should not sell your catalog. You should just hold on to it and keep collecting those royalties. Right. So okay. that's perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Perfect. Totally, totally perfect. Um, okay. I'm going to mute you again, unless you have more questions. Which I'm totally Thank down. you. Thank okay. you. Um, all right. So anybody else have questions that I can answer before I hang up and go do some more work? Going once, going twice. All right. Well, thank, thank you everybody for joining Matt. Thank you for asking that question live and uh, I'll see you all next month.